They feel I am who I am. I am where I am. And what I'm going through is what I'm going through. And I just got to grip my teeth and get through it. That endeavor is really where the true secret lies. Now that endeavor is not easy because you have to overcome your fears. You have to overcome those obstacles and challenges that are facing you. Some people can become so so spiritual that they forget the material and forget that actually here in a reality that yeah, has yeah. physics and dynamics and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you get the other side, which are people just strictly about this yeah. and they don't even think about the other side. Yeah. So welcome everybody to the Martial Mind Power podcast. And today we have a very special episode because for the first time we're going to do this live type of setting. And uh, yeah, as we usually start, um, Sifu Lakloy, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank <laughs> you. Very well, we're here at our Martial Mind Power Talks today, at which we're doing a, an exclusive Martial Mind Power podcast for the first time. And for the first time ever, we've got a guest, right? So this is... You know, we'd like to introduce His Holiness, Geshe Mama Harai Swami. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's an honor to be with all of you. I can't say I was a martial artist myself. I did do a little bit of school. I got up to the green belt. So uh, I have a bit of bit of a martial background, I, I guess you could say. But uh, yeah, I became a monk uh, just over 25 years ago. But I'm sure we have a lot in common. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the monastic element is, you know, is part of that. You know, you've got the inner warrior that's always serving through the spiritual outlet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's there. And, you know, once, once you've gone down that martial arts path, it never leaves you. You know, it's always, always there. So it's in your system, as they say. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But the way, the way we normally uh, do our martial mind power podcast is quite interesting because uh, a few years ago, I was inspired through my own spiritual experiences and awakening to uh, write a book. And uh, um, I wrote this book, and they were kind of a series of uh, what I call divine downloads, mm-hmm. um, you know, messages you know, that I'd get. You know, kind of, and uh, I'd start to write them down, and as I wrote them down, they kind of formed into this book here. And <laughs> really, what I wanted to do was trying to help share some of those experiences to help others find it in themselves. Mm. But um, uh, in martial, typical martial arts style, I decided to go down a koan route. And Japanese koans are like poems or riddles, mm. <laughs> very similar to the way you like to work and speak as well. Uh, so we've got that, that in, thing in common. And the idea of these koans is it's usually a very short phrase or a, a coinage of a few words, fewer the better. But within those words, there's uh, when you hear them, and if you hear them with complete detachment and free from everything, then there's a spiritual experience that happens inside you. And if you are tuned into yourself, you can register that spiritual experience that happens in you. It's a moment, mm-hmm. thought. Mm-hmm. And there lies a lesson. Mm. And uh, this is why we call, I ended up calling this book, The Art of Thinking Without Thinking. Mm. Now, you know, we're not trying to plug books here, (laughs) right? But what we are trying to do is help connect with people and help them connect to their inner self. Mm. So what we started to do was, JT's like, hey, let's let's start doing a podcast. I'm like, okay, how do you want to do it? Well, in typical fashion, I want to give the book to JT okay. and he'll show you how we pick the koan. Okay. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yeah. So usually we have a Google uh, number generator on the oh, computer, but that. today we haven't. So we're going to just randomly open the book yeah. and whatever yeah. page it falls on is what we're going should to talk we ask, about. Shall we ask Keshav yeah. Maharaj to do it? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Yes, so why do, not? You just want me to open it? Just just flick, it. Where you, flick, flick the book to where you are. If it's got a tick in it, we've already covered it. <laughs> Okay. Oh, oh. What have we got? Have and we done this that is, one before? This, is that okay? We have not done this one uh, before. So if I take that. Now, this is the thing, right? Whenever we... We normally have a preamble before we do a podcast. And whatever topic comes up, when we flick through the book, it comes up. Right? <laughs> so, and you'll understand what I, what I mean when I say this. So I'm going to say the actual koan now. And the idea really is to... 
when you hear it, just allow the words to fall on your ears and to sink into your soul. And whatever you feel, think, experience in that moment is the teaching, right? But the, the trick is, can you translate that? Can you register that, right? So this is a very meditative experience, a meditative way of working and learning. But we've tried to do it in a playful style and help show people how we do it through the podcast. All right? So you ready for this? Okay, so. I am the prison, prisoner and prison keeper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Yes, yeah? in typical fashion. Yeah? Typical fashion. Yeah. All right, it's back on the, bang on the money again, right? Yes. So. I'm going to put it out to Kechua Maharaj first, right? It's like, what did that koan say to you? When I heard that, two predominant feelings came to my mind, which may seem contradictory. The first feeling that came to my mind was the feeling of being humbled. And the simultaneous feeling which came was the feeling of being extremely hopeful. Because when I heard that, I realized I'm the one who've caused, I'm the one who's caused my current situation. In my previous presentation, I was calling out how we often blame others for where we are. We blame other people, we blame the government, we blame the media, we blame God. But actually, we're the ones who are the architects, the designers of our destiny. And we're the ones that created the prison that we're living in now. So it's humbling. But at the same time, it's incredibly hopeful because we're not just the prisoner, but we're the prison keeper. Just as our past actions imprisoned us, our present actions can free us. And this is incredibly powerful because most people in the world have lost the um, conviction and confidence that they can change their life. They feel I am who I am, I am where I am, and what I'm going through is what I'm going through, and I just got to grip my teeth and get through it. But this beautiful insight reminds us that we should be hopeful and empowered because we can design a better destiny for ourselves. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, you know, earlier on we said, you know, how when we preamble before we pick a koan, it's normally related to what we're talking about. Yeah. And you've just given us this amazing martial mind power talk. And the koan you picked is directly connected to exactly yeah. what you just spoke about and the wisdom that you shared. And, and this is... The beauty I want to share with the world is that magic is happening right in front of you. We have not orchestrated any of this. This is purely freestyle, right? Because I did have a backup. Come on, <laughs> choose. <laughs> Just in case. Right. <laughs> right. But I decided, hey, you know what? Let's, let's keep it free and open because there's something, there's divine forces outside us that are guiding us, you know? Absolutely. And uh, as a consequence, you know, we're continuing to talk about this topic. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So how beautiful is that? Exactly. JT, what, what did you experience in that? Oh man, that was a, that was a deep one. So in, a, in a Punjabi, we have this word called pinjar. Pinjar means cage, mm. right? And um, what it refers to is like this body. Right? Mm. That it's like a cage in a way. We've come here, we've got this cage, we live in this body, we live it out, yeah. but it's your cage, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's whatever you do with it. So it had that element of it. Yeah. And then also, like you said, the, the mind, you know, how much, how we attach to our thoughts, how we can become a prisoner of our own thoughts, yeah. right? And it's only until we decide to look at it. There's that story, you just came to my mind. There was this story I heard once about, no, actually it was practical jokers. That's what it was. Practical jokers is what I saw, yeah? So what happened was <laughs> they, they punished the guy when they, they got through these challenges. They punished the guy at the end. Um, they put him in this uh, kind of zoo room type thing. And they had him doing all these tasks throughout the day. And um, the idea is that you're supposed to finish your task and then when you've done your task, your punishment's over and you're allowed to leave. Mm -hmm. But what they did was they, um, they kind of left and he's sitting there like it's gone like eight o'clock at night and he's like, what's going on? Why is this punishment not finished? 
And he phones him up and he says, guys, why is the punishment not finished? And they go, yeah, it's finished ages ago. He said, what do you mean? So are you going to open the cage for me, uh, the door for me? And he said, it's already open. <laughs> and they never locked it in the first place. So he went through all that thing, went through it, and the door was already open. So he created that cage within himself. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that pops up. And that really kind of uh, connects back to Maharaj's talk, you know, that we, we have the key to our own prison door, you know, and we have to learn how to unlock it ourselves. You know, we've got to make that endeavor. If we don't use that key to open the door ourselves, we remain where we are. There's also um, um, a story about this bird in a cage. You know, every day the owner would put some food out, some bird seed out for the, for the bird, and then lock the door. Uh, and one day, it's a beautiful sunny day, and uh, the owner's got the windows open, and uh, she puts some bird seed out, but she forgets to, forgets to close the birdcage door. So the bird's sitting there, thinking, shall I, shall I not, shall I, shall I not, shall I, shall I not, you know? But what if I do, what will happen? And out of, own, out of her own fear, she stayed where she was, mm. you know? She could have flown free and, and be, become liberated. But she had to make the endeavor. But that endeavor is really where the true secret lies. Now, that endeavor is not easy because you have to overcome your fears. You have to overcome those obstacles and challenges that are facing you. And this is what we call self mastery is cultivating your body, your mind, your emotion, and spirit. Now, there's many different words for that and self actualization, self realization. The highest level of self-realization is God-realization, right? Because you're now no longer bound by this body. You know, Krishna Maharaj, when we talked about uh, the Bhagavad Gita, the first chapter in the Bhagavad Gita talks about we are not this body. You know, we are spirit soul. So if we are spirit soul, then we're trying to liberate that part of it. As martial artists, as martial artists, we talk about body, mind, emotion, spirit, or body, mind, spirit, they say. Well, let's say there's four as to attributes to this, body, the mind, the emotion, the spirit. Well, if you're only training in the body, you're missing three quarters of your martial artist. So you're only ever going to be 25% if you get that good. But most people don't get that good because they don't stick to it. So do you want to be a sub-25% person or you want to be holistic? As Bruce Lee said, do you want to live in a totality? You know, do you want to bring it all together? All right? So this endeavor of self-mastery is the process, as we call it, you know, it's, it's doing that. What do you think is the, like the, you know, the true purpose of self-mastery? Yeah, self-mastery is an interesting term. And what we would say coming from the Vedic perspective is we'll look at it slightly differently. Self-mastery doesn't mean to conquer over yourself. It rather means to allow yourself to be the master. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Right now, as you mentioned, there are different aspects to our being. There's our body, there's our mind, and then there's the soul, which is who we are. Most people in the world have allowed their mind to dominate their self, their mind to dominate their soul, the mind to dictate over the voice of the soul. So for us, what self-mastery means is it means to reinstill the soul in its position where it can actually direct the trajectory of our life instead of our mind. On a cigarette packet 30 years ago, the sign was smoking may damage your health. 10 years later, the sign was smoking seriously damages your health. The sign 10 years later was smoking causes cancer. And the sign now is smoking kills. Now, isn't it amazing how someone can pick up a box which basically says, if you touch me, you're going to die. And someone still picks it up and smokes. 
Why is that? Is that the self making a decision? Or is that the mind making a decision? And self-mastery means to not let your mind make the decision, but to let yourself make the decision. But in order to do that, you have to disassociate the mind from the self. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you're on, on that note, like the, you know, one of the questions, I mean, people ask these questions, so that's why we bring them up. You know, they, how, how do you actually do, differentiate between what mind, body, and spirit is? You know, what's, what's, um, what's your take on that? Because everyone's yeah. got, they said, talk about the mind. Are they totally referring to the brain? Are they referring to something higher? Like, you know, those questions yeah, come up. Yeah, yeah. Probably the easiest uh, analogy I use is the in analogy of a computer. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the monitor, the keyboard, the mouse, that's like the body, the hardware. And then there's the person behind the computer press pushing buttons. They're like the soul or the spirit. But in order for the soul or the spirit or the user to do something with a computer, the monitor and all of that, what do you need? Software. You need an interface. Otherwise, you can't do anything. So the mind, the intelligence, that's like the software of our existence. So, for example, another analogy I sometimes use to help people understand the difference between the self and the mind is I say, think of the mind as an internet browser. Now, an internet browser is not alive, but an internet browser has a default page. An internet browser has a history. An internet browser has an autocomplete. An internet browser has favorites. So according to the person using the thing, as soon as they double click the internet browser, already a page comes up. That's the mind. It has a default way of thinking. As soon as someone types www.a, a bunch of websites come up. The mind's like that. As soon as you see one thing, I see a, you know, a basketball ring there, it will trigger another thought. That's how the mind works. An internet browser has favorites, which always induce you to go in that direction. The mind is like that. But you can reconfigure an internet browser. You can change the home page. You can delete the history. You can get rid of the cookies. So the mind is like that. It's a browser. And what it does is with the help of the mind, we basically make decisions and navigate this world, but we are not the mind. Just like you're not the internet browser, you use it. But if you haven't configured it, the internet browser can take you astray. So big, big lesson out of that is, <clears throat> that's how you put spirituality into your Bachelor of Information Management. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about the cookies. <laughs> But that's a beautiful, beautifully clear yeah. analogy. So thank you for sharing that. Mm. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very, it's like when, when we talk about um, mind, body, spirit, we've spoke, spoken about in the past as well. We, we, we refer, like we say, um, like the body is like this, what you see, the material kind of stuff, right? And then the spirit is the side you can't see. Yeah. And then the, the mind is like the bridge between yeah. those two things. It's like an interface or a connector. Yeah. 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 What I loved when I read spiritual books was basically everything I was experiencing day to day here was now like a clear explanation of it. Like what I'm saying here is not things that we don't experience. We experience all these things every day. But what we don't understand is why is it like this? Like what's the mechanics? Like how, why is it set up like this? So when you read the ancient books of wisdom, it's almost like it helps you to decode what you're experiencing every day. And then you're like, oh, that's why my mind is like that. That's why I struggle. That's why I'm negative. You know? Yeah, it's, it's funny, I'm enjoying myself when we were driving down here today. We were talking exactly about that. Like, we're not really taught how to think. Yeah. You know, we're just like left to our own devices to go through life, just kind of figure it out. Yeah. So it's like when we're taught how to think, and understand, like you said, these concepts of the mind and how it works yeah. and your thoughts and your attachment and all this kind of thing. Now you become the observer, like you're saying, you kind of yes. see that. Yes. You know, and then you know, be able to actually do something about it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yesterday I was doing an event and someone asked me, what do you think about the modern educational system? 
And there were many things I could, could say about that. And I don't want to only say negative things, but I said to them, modern education teaches you what to think, but they don't teach you how to think. When I went to university, I often feel it's just like memorizing things to then regurgitate in an exam, to then get a piece of paper, to then graduate and say, you've gone through the whole, and how much through all of that process did I actually learn how to think? You just told me what to think. What's the highest level of thinking or the highest way of thinking? Often what we're doing in the world today is we're thinking from our standpoint and then we're trying to see as much as we can see around us. But the highest level of thinking is when we take the vision of the personality who has the broadest vision and then we see through them. We often tell this story of a frog in the well. And there were two frogs in the well. And one frog decided to go off and try and discover what the Pacific Ocean was. So the frog went jumping over and then came back and said to the other frog in the well, they said, like, I've just been to the Pacific Ocean. It's huge. And this frog in the well said, huge? Like, how huge could it be? Is it double the amount of water in this well? And he said, no, no, it's like much bigger than that. So this frog in the well said, well, what do you think? Like three times as much as water is that's in this well. <laughs> so the other frog is thinking like, this person can only think in terms of, he said, no, much bigger. And he goes like, I mean, it can't be more than five times the amount of water. So it goes like this. And because we always try to think based on our limited experience, we can't actually perceive the vastness of this creation. But when we tap into spiritual knowledge, which is the knowledge of the sages, the knowledge of the saints, and ultimately the knowledge of divinity, and when we see through that lens, then we see something much greater. Therefore, we say, small minds discuss people. Average minds discuss events. But great minds discuss wisdom. And then what they do is they see events and people through that lens of wisdom. And that's why these talks that you have are so powerful because they give a lens, a way of thinking through which you can see something much beyond. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for articulating with such je ne sais quoi. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. How can people cultivate that? Mm. Really is the main question. How can we make it pragmatically accessible for people? What do they need to do to start cultivating that? In my previous talk, I was mentioning the opportunity to join the 5 a.m. club. The opportunity to rise before the sun the opportunity to take advantage of the early morning hours of the day, which are still. And in those morning hours, if one is able to connect with spiritual wisdom, today we just read one line. And here we are, it led to a stream of thoughts, a stream of uplifting insights that if we then carry with us throughout our day, we live with an elevated state. And so what we tell people is just spend 10 minutes every day reading wisdom because that wisdom gives you a lens through which to process everything that goes on around you. So I tell people, join the 5 a.m. club before you join the 9 a.m. reality. <laughs> I like that. I like and what that. I say to them is if you don't join the 5 a.m. club before you enter the 9 a.m. reality, it will become the 12 p.m. catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> but but there's so much reality in that. Mm -hmm. So I'm throwing a tangent out there. Yeah. I've got to ask, it's martial yeah. arts, right? <laughs> when you were back at uni, Bruce Lee? 
Well, you're oh, fine. yeah, Bruce Lee. I, 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 there's this one video of Bruce Lee where he talks about the mind. Yes. I don't know if you know that oh, video. 100%. It's a famous yeah. one. And he, and he says the mind has to be like water. It has to flow. And, you know, I mean, he, he had it all, you know. <laughs> he used to send my, you know, put the hair standing on end, you know. It was like, it was profound. But, yeah, it's beautiful. I, I really appreciate how you bring the, the body, mind, and this soul aspect together. Because uh, in the world today, what people try to do is separate those. So on one hand, people just do the physical and then they just like neglect anything spiritual. But then the interesting thing is sometimes people do the opposite as well. They, they look into spiritual wisdom, they practice spirituality, but then they don't care for their body. They don't maintain and train their body and the body is a temple. So I've found many spiritual people who don't take care of their health because in some way they think that's spiritual. But even though you're not your body, your body is a temple. It's a machine yeah. and it's a vehicle through which you can do amazing things in the world. So yes, you're the soul, but why would you not take care of your body? And that's why I appreciate that you bring both together. Man, that's man. powerful. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we see that all the time because um, sometimes we get polarities taking place, right, yeah. in, in our thinking as well. And we see all the time, you know, like you said, some people can become so, so spiritual that they forget the material and forget they're actually here in a reality that yeah. has yeah. physics and dynamics and stuff like that. Yeah. And then you get the other side, which are people just strictly about this yeah. and they don't even think about the other side. Yeah. So finding that balance and that kind of middle path, as they say, yeah. is quite ideal isn't it <laughs> the buddhists speak about the middle way mm. <clears throat> but it's really about a state of mind yeah um and it's about you know not being you know too sad not being too happy when everything happens it's just traversing that line you know um and at the same time you know we talk about mind body and spirit you know boom, boom, boom. but you know you are all of those things as bruce would say you are a totality you know, you are greater than the sum of the parts. Mm. Now, if we look at the parts, and we do live <laughs> in an, what I refer to as an atomized world, we break things down to the smallest unit because that's how we're taught to think, mm. right? We have to break things down to the smallest unit, otherwise you, you won't make sense. But, you know, if I laid out, you know, all the pieces of a Ferrari in this, on this floor, you'd look at it and think, what a mess. What is this? Well, if I put it together, you'll be like, oh, wow, so it's a Ferrari. But, but then when you drive it, you're amazing. It's even more than that. It starts to stir emotions and things, right? So it's more than those pieces when they're put together. Mm. On top of that, it can take you somewhere, yeah. <laughs> right? So mm. it does a lot more. Now, we just take a, a, like a material example. But we ourselves are in that same way. Mm. And when we bring all of those elements together and cultivate all of those elements to the best that we can, given the best resources that we can, and go out there and search guidance from bona fide masters that have already done that, then they can hold our hand and take us to a higher level of elevation. And that's what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. you know, you're shit departed and shit deployed your amazing wisdom uh, after you know over two decades of studying so you can share that with the rest of the world I mean that in itself is mind blowing you're just helping others so they can find it in themselves I mean you discover your totality and now you said hey guys you can all be we can all discover this amazing thing mm. are you interested well if you are Inquire within, <laughs> literally. <laughs> That's exactly it, though, is it? It's the mastery because yeah. someone's been doing it for such yeah. a long period of time. It, it gives them that authority to teach back because yeah. they have got those years of experience and, and knowledge, and yeah. you know, which nowadays is just like you know, is a little Instagram post with no meaning behind it, Definitely. right? Yeah. <laughs> and equally, I think um, that's very kind words from both of you, and I, I think equally. I feel like I'm learning every day. 
I learn from both of you. I don't feel as though I'm uh, higher than or better than anyone else. Every soul is amazing. Perhaps on my journey, I met teachers and contacted wisdom that empowered my life in different ways. Equally, I think everyone on this journey has picked up many amazing insights. I have friends from the Christian background, from the Muslim background, from the Sikh background, um, Buddhist background, and I learn so much from them every day. And one beauty I try to embrace in my life is to look at the unity and diversity. And this idea that when we get beyond differences in ritual and culture, and that we begin looking at the core of what all spiritual people pursue in the deepest you know, recesses of their heart, that's all universal. And I think if we could have more forums where we exchange openly mm -hmm. like that, then we'll actually see we have a lot more in common than we think. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. and, and that's really what the world needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. one, of, one, one of my Sufis once taught me this lesson, <clears throat> um, and it stems off the back of a story that JT actually taught me, you know, which was you, know, you put a group of martial arts students in a room from different disciplines, They'll all argue over which art's better. But you put a group of martial arts masters in a room, they'll all discuss the commonalities. Mm -hmm. And it's the common thread, or what we commonly talk about, the universal truths mm -hmm. that are the same for everybody is where everything lies. And really what we're trying to discover is that not just in ourselves on a daily basis so that we can make it practically accessible and be able to get into the habit of, as you said, learning how to think, and that how to think is how can you see that in everyday life? Mm. What is a commonality? You've got a conflict with someone, change that around and find out what is common here. How do you relate to one another mm. and harmonize, see things from their perspective? As you said, put yourself into them. Mm. The higher thinking, as you mentioned mm. earlier, and all of a sudden, now you start to harmonize because you understand. Understanding is really the secret. Once you understand, you know why they're behaving, acting, and saying the things they're doing. And then you know how to respond to that yeah. through wisdom. Um, so the commonalities is really the, the key. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest thing to do is to put that into practice on a daily basis, especially when you face with challenges. Mm -hmm. And something you mentioned earlier on, you've got your browser history, right? So if you, if you go, <laughs> if you if you experience something that triggers with something from your browser history, it's just going to go back there mm. and it recreates that whole thing again. But to change that, you have to maybe erase some of that or just try and code in something different. So we're constantly reprogramming our consciousness, and through reprogramming our consciousness, we're changing the way we're thinking how to think, how to see the world, how to be in the world. And then it's a, a becoming or a higher version of yourself. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. Mm. So, and just to add on to that browser analogy, once you've, you know, optimized it and configured it to the best way you can, there's always a chance of pop-ups. <laughs> and I think that's, but that's a really important yeah. point. Because yeah. sometimes we think self-mastery means that I'm going to be perfect every single day. That not one negative or fault-finding thought is going to come in my mind or not one material desire. But even in the mind of, a, of, of someone who, who is a master, who is very accomplished, because we have a material mind, there might be some things that come up, a few pop-ups. But the difference is we don't follow the links. We just hit that X and just get on with what we're doing and just say, like, that's not important. I know where I'm going. And I think it is an important point because oftentimes we think we have to become perfect. But more than becoming perfect is being perfectly sincere because it's all in intention. You know, we could do something different because we got access to people. Yeah. Is there anyone who's got a question that they want to ask <laughs> and, you know, and get featured? 
is it possible to live both lives, to live a mixture of your way of life and incorporate your incredible way of thinking with what's been hard-coded to someone who is brainwashed to be materialistic? <laughs> it's difficult to understand what I'm asking, but no, it's just switch from one to the, is there an amalgamation possible or is it one thinking or the other? One writer says we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. I don't think we become spiritual. We're all spiritual by nature. But as you've mentioned, through our journey in life, we pick up opinions, narratives, we pick up certain ways of viewing the world that kind of fix us into a vision of life. But spirituality, what I see it as is more than adding or changing. It's just about removing that which is covering who I really am. We live in a world in which we're imprisoned into inauthenticity. One person says, I'm not who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I'm who I think you think I am. That's how disconnected we've become from our own authenticity. And so what I see spirituality is, as is a crumbling away of everything the world told us to be, the media paints as success, all the superfluous things that have been impressed upon us which have hijacked our inner voice. And I think it is possible to do it, but that time to disconnect is really important. And uh, without going on long, I'll probably just end with this point. When I was in India traveling, I met one yogi and I asked him for some advice. And he looked at me and he said, every year, disconnect for one month. Every week, disconnect for one day. And every day, disconnect for one hour. And then he looked at me and he said, disconnect to connect. And I looked at him and I said, you should be on TEDx. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a nice point, disconnect to connect. And the only way we can find our authentic self is when we take a little bit of breathing space away from all the opinions, the expectations, the narratives, the pressures of the world. And we just take a breather away from that. Then we can begin to hear the heart. There's two aspects of that as well. One is from the self, if that's something that you need to cultivate in yourself. And the other is if somebody else has those qualities that you're trying to tolerate and you're having to exercise patience around. The only way in my experience to deal with that is to be the change in yourself. Because you, when you become more patient and more tolerant, then they'll see that and they might one day ask you, how did you do that? How are you so calm? And that's when you get to help hold their hand and take them on that journey rather than trying to ram those teachings down their throat because they, that won't work. They'll resist it. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's two elements. And uh, when you're experiencing that yourself, you first start by asking the question, why don't you change? Why don't you do something? But our true empowerment is when we actually become the change in ourselves. Mm. Nice. Sorry, one more question. It was based on that, uh, those are beautiful words. And what came to my mind is at the moment, we've got a generation of children and young people mm. who are so disconnected because they live in a, a world that's not real. And mm. um, what is it we all can do here in some way or take away today? that we can try and help change that mindset of the young people that are living in iPads and iPhones and yeah. they're totally wired in. They're into the matrix, aren't they? Yeah. How can we cut those wires? <laughs> <laughs> Someone once sent me a message and it was a one-liner. They said, get off Facebook and get your face into a book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. What we sometimes do with young people, 
is we do digital detox weekends. And, you know, like in the first hour, they're like, oh, you know, it's like withdrawal symptoms, you know. But what we do is we take them up to the mountains or something and we say like, all right, everyone, look, you may as well get rid of your device because there's no connection here anyway. And so they do like an amnesty at the beginning of the weekend and everyone just puts their phone into the box. And we just walk, we go for bike rides, we connect with nature, we talk, we play sports, we discuss wisdom, and we just interact, we spend time together. Um, I'm just looking out the window here and it's just beautiful to pe see people playing basketball, you know, and like instead of doing it on their PlayStation, you know, um, it's beautiful. And nature is very powerful, more powerful than we know. And I think if from a young age, we can give uh, young people experiences of nature, you, sometimes you think like nature, what's a, what's a big deal about that? But it's all connected. When you, your feet touch the ground, when you drink water from a fresh stream, when you smell the flowers in a forest, that does something to your consciousness. And most people just don't because we live in urban hubs, you know, in the urban jungle. We never really experience true nature. And so that's something you can try out with young people. Just let them have an experience. And then they come back to the world. And I'm not saying they just become overnight sages or something. And, but, they, but they connect more with the world. And they know that that's such a beautiful thing. And let me not spend my whole day in front of a screen. But let me interact with the real world, which is beautiful. So normally at the end of the podcast, we um, read the actual koan itself. Oh, okay. So um, I think today I'd like you to do the honours. Right, it's a very short one, as most of them really are quite short. <laughs> your mind is a prison, and your divine being has been kept prisoner within it. If you try and escape, the suffering gets worse. Don't strive, just experience what you have to. Reveal your true, authentic, highest self. Any resistance will just create more suffering. As they say, what you resist persists. Surrender to everything and allow yourself to dissolve in life so you can ascend the lessons life is serving you. And when done, you will liberate yourself. You are the prison keeper, after all. And you have the keys to the kingdom. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you me. so much for reading that out. And, um, you know, we, did, we, we, we always run out of time. We got to, yeah. you know, that's the one thing we don't, can't get back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So from... Well, on behalf of myself and Lex, we want to thank you, you know, for taking the time out of your busy schedule. But before we close off, any final thoughts, whether it's on the koan or <coughs> the topics that we've discussed in this interview? I guess I'll pick up on one point you made, which I think is, deserves to be highlighted. To go on the spiritual path, we have to be brave. To go on the spiritual path, we have to be courageous, fearless. To go on the spiritual path means to go against the grain to some extent. To go, get, go on the spiritual path means to challenge ourselves, to challenge our thoughts, our desires, our aspirations. It can be uncomfortable. But I'll just end with a final thought. They say the pain of that discipline to go on the spiritual path is uncomfortable. But the pain of regret is unbearable. And so while that spiritual journey is not an easy one, it requires discipline and courage, and it's definitely uncomfortable. If we don't stay true to ourselves and walk that journey, then the pain of regret that will suffer as a consequence will be unbearable. 
And so one of my meditations as I wake up every day is let me not live a life in which there'll be any regrets. And in order to do that, you have to live the life of bravery, discipline, have a strong mind, but also a soft heart. Wow. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure having you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You, you can't make that up, but you know, there's an element of that. Amanjo and me were talking about in the car. Yeah. You know, uh, so <laughs> it, it all ties in. It all ties in. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So keep, keep doing what you're doing. So everyone, there you go. That was a special Martian Mind Power. And like always, we're plugging the book. <laughs> Get it from Amazon. <laughs> and um, to both for you and to everybody else, so we hope you take value from this. And until next time, signing out. Thank you so Thank much. You